Okay, you want me to take over? Right. Yes, please. That would be that would be that would be wonderful. Okay. <clears throat> well, welcome. And today's topic that I want to address is: Do we pursue sustainable adaptation to sea level rise in the New York City metropolitan region? And there are multiple options, but there is also a practice so far, and we see how they either converge or diverge. <clears throat> I should say probably <clears throat> that th this is not strictly a science talk, um, as probably most other seminars of that series are. It is one that merges uh, science with the public sector issues. And <clears throat> so you could think of it more as an op-ed piece rather than uh, a scientific report. Uh, the topics that I want to address is what are the sea level rise forecasts, uh, both globally, but uh, more importantly for this area regionally, and uh, <clears throat> how that interacts with storm surge probabilities and the related risks, risks that come from that. Then I will touch on a few basic risk management and adaptation options, uh, hypothetically. And then we go more into uh, what various agencies that are, are contributing to the region have proposed. In particular, I want to comment on the US Army Corps of Engineer HATS study that stands for Harbor and tributary study, and it came out with several alternatives. Uh, and I want particular comment on alternative two, which has sea gates between Sandy Hook, New Jersey and Breezy Point in Queens, New York. Then <clears throat> I want to look uh, how current development in New York City actually proceeds and whether that makes sense in the context of a sustainable city for the future. And then we will have some conclusions. But <clears throat> let me start and pointing out the conclusions up front and then come back at the end again. Uh, given that we don't know with reasonable confidence how quickly the global community inclusive of course are uh, happily uh, in denial sometimes us will be able to wean itself off fossil fuels and therefore when we can stop emitting greenhouse gases and therefore what sea level rise trajectories we will encounter for the next few centuries and <clears throat> unless New York City develops and implements a comprehensive and an adaptive plan for land use, rezoning, uh, and looks at the demands of housing and social and transportation and economic infrastructure. And all this, of course, vis-a-vis uh, vis -vis the potentially extreme sea level rise scenarios because of the uncertainty we may have to prepare for not just the average, but the, the extremes. Then <clears throat> I come to the conclusion that the economic health of this region and the risk is going in a unsustainable direction. Therefore, it needs political will and we have to have transformative actions that are urgently needed and we can't wait on that. <clears throat> it's actually interesting to compare our current situation with the epidemic where we Hesitation often leads 
to a severe, more severe risk exposure. And we have a similar con <clears throat> situation here where we have to flatten some curves in this case, the greenhouse gas curves. So, <clears throat> uh, humanity has built itself sometimes habitats in very grotesque areas. This is one case uh, where there is a little atoll island that's about almost a thousand kilometers from any continent, believe it or not. It's pretty bizarre. It's of course the Maldives uh, perched together on this little piece of coral reef on top of a sea mountain. And uh, Hmm. Not always is it the risks related to sea level rise. This is obviously a very poor city uh, on top of an earthquake fault, in this case, Port au Prince in Haiti, that during the last decade uh, experienced a severe earthquake and you see the consequences. So we are, as a human species, often very ill prepared with our habitats. And then of course, we have this animal that doesn't need any uh, explanations. Uh, we are all familiar with it and some of us are right now in it. So, Given these uh, precarious locations that we have accumulated huge assets, that causes obviously risks. But let me first go to the sea level rise issue in a larger context. Let's, let's look backward 20,000 years and let's look forward in the order of 10,000 years. So a total of 30,000 years on that graph. Of course, between minus 20,000 and about 7,000 years, we saw sea level rise in excess of 100 meters due to the retreat of the land-based ice in North America, Scandinavia, and other places around the world, which ended up <clears throat> in the ocean. And uh, from 7,000 years back to current time, we call it after all the Holocene, we had the luxury of an extremely stable climate by and large, and sea level. So that's essentially the time during which most of what we call civilization developed. And we got used to living near the shorelines that didn't change much. And that is something so built in into our cultures that we have great difficulty to dealing with a new situation which starts at time zero called today here, in which uh, what many now call the Anthropocene, we have to deal with the consequences of our fossil fuel uh, energy consumption. And you see to uh, the right of time zero, various projections for various pentagrams of carbon, pentagram is 10 to the 15th power of gram. Uh, and so you see that some of those blue curves rise faster than uh, the pre-Holocene, meaning Pleistocene time. Uh, and some are rising slightly less. And if you look at the total amount of sea level rise that this particular paper, which was published in 2016 in Nature, uh, where the sea level rise stabilized, uh, this paper uh, projects 
anywhere between 25 meters to 50 meters uh, above uh, current sea level. Given those different uh, fossil fuel uh, carbon uh, based uh, emissions into the atmosphere. Now, that's a long time to look into the future, and that's not how urban planning is being done. So let's go to a slightly shorter time schedule. This is only 500 years now. And let's focus only on the upper graph here on the upper left. You see a red line, a blue line, a green line, and a black line, and around them, there are uncertainty bands. These are what the climate folks call different uh, RPCs, or rep uh, representative concentration pathways. Uh, that simply reflects, for instance, in the red one or somewhere between red and blue, the Paris Agreement. If we were really uh, following that, then this is one projected sea level rise for the next uh, 400 year or so. And uh, that's a paper uh, that was published quite a while ago, eight thousand uh, in 2012, so eight years ago. So that's not the latest science, but uh, it's one of the few papers that looks uh, more than just to the year 2100. And these are global average sea level rise forecasts. I put a red dot and a blue dot and related horizontal lines, so you get the elevations on the left in meters, on the right in feet. For the New York City area, that the NPCC, the New York City Panel on Climate Change, had made. New York experiences higher sea level rise uh, than the global average for a variety of reasons. One is that we're still sinking uh, into the ocean due to the isostatic uh, adjustments post glacial from the unloading of the ice load in North America. But there are other reasons, uh, and I'm not the climate scientist uh, or oceanographer to tell you why. Uh, others can do that better. Some of them may be actually in the audience here. But they are indicating for the year 2100, a six foot sea level rise that is the 90 percentile of the forecast by the New York City Panel of Climate Change. Or if what uh, the New York NPCC calls the Antarctic Rapid Ice Melt Scenario, RM, then the blue would apply by the year 2100, uh, and that would be uh, roughly nine feet, slightly in excess of nine feet. So these are the kind of things that we need to consider as possibilities since we don't know which of those scenarios globally and regionally will really come to fruition. It depends, again, whether Trump will win or whether Paris will win. Now let's go to the region. <clears throat> Here's an image of four of the five boroughs, a little bit the hinterland. Uh, the fifth borough, uh, Borough uh, Staten Island, is to the lower left of the screen. And what you see here is the so-called slush modeling, uh, which is a computer program that quite some time ago NOAA had uh, developed. Um, and uh, in red, yellow, uh, or ochre, and yellow and green, you see where the category one, two, three, and four hurricanes would go. Uh, there's a little footnote. It's actually the worst case. They run, let's say, a couple of thousand uh, uh, scenarios of hurricanes, and then they pick the worst path, meaning worst in uh, terms of flooding, 
And then the worst coincidence, coincidence with uh, uh, tides and so on. So it's what they call mums, the maximum of maximum. So these are extreme values. But when you look actually what the numbers are, they are quite uh, amazing. For category one, it would be four meters and so on. For category four, it would be as much as 10 meters down in the East River <clears throat> near, uh, I guess that's the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, and these are, of course, deterministic forecasts. The New York City Panel on Climate Change made all its forecasts, both for sea level and for storms, in, in a probabilistic way. And here is a slide that shows you have uh, uh, 100 years on uh, the time scale, and you see sea level rise in inches. And uh, the dotted line on the bottom is the extrapolation from the past century into the future, very modest, roughly a, a foot per century. Uh, and then you have a blue, uh, purple, green, and red line that are marked with 10 percentile, 25, 75, and 90 percentile values. Since both the uh, representative pathways, but also there are differences in modeling approaches, provides a whole array of outputs for the future. The New York City Pen on Climate Change uh, decided to show it in this uh, way in looking at different levels of confidence in the distribution of the data. The recommendation by the NPCC was, and that has been largely been followed, to take the 90 percentile. Now you may say, why such a high value? Well, if you take, let's say, the median value, which is only in the order of uh, close to three feet by the year 2100, then you have a 50 percent chance essentially to be overwhelmed. And for a city like New York, you don't want to take a 50% chance. I always use the example, if you were to buy an airline ticket to fly out to San Francisco, and the airline tells you there's a 90% chance that the plane will not fall off the sky, but there's a 10% chance it will, you will run to another airline and get one that says better 99% or whatever. So uh, for these high consequence kind of uh, risk situations, you better err on the safer side. To, so the 90 percentile still means there's a 10 percent chance that you are actually maybe too low in your decision making. Uh, in 2019, uh, these values that I first showed were, were published in, by NPCC in 2015. In 2019, it added two values for the 2080s and the end of the century in the order of uh, close to seven feet for 2080s and uh, nine and a half feet or so for <clears throat> the year 2100. That is the so-called RM of or Antarctic uh, <clears throat> rapid ice melt scenario. Uh, I won't go into the reasons why the node earlier, any forecasts, anyhow, that's uh, what the NPCC did. Now, <clears throat> when you take the 90 percentile sea level rise that we just saw and combine it with uh, the storm surges, and let's go to the left side of these slides. So we have roughly 120 years here, 140 years on, on the time scale. And we have now on the uh, vertical uh, coordinate, the storm surge elevations in feet above North American vertical datum of 1988, which is what, for instance, the FEMA flood maps are tagged to and so on. And that's down for the battery, the tight gauge in New York City. Then you have, go to the left uh, data points under Sandy, uh, a red 
square, a green triangle, a purple and a blue uh, marker. These are the 10 year storm surge heights, the 100 year storm surge height, the 500 year storm surge. And by some questionable uh, <clears throat> argument, you could say that the uh, Sandy was a 700 year storm surge height. Now, these storm surge heights are being lifted up with time by sea level rise because you have, of course, the storms on top of whatever the sea level is. That's the simplest way of modeling it. The reality may be slightly more complicated. And now let's go here to the place uh, where it says Sandy. I use my pointer here. I hope you can see that. And let's assume there was a subway entrance that was at uh, 11 and a half feet of elevation and it was flooded and it contributed to the flooding of the subway system. We stay <clears throat> at the same subway entrance and go up in time and then we see that roughly by the year 2090, that same subway entrance now gets flooded by a 10 year storm surge combined with a sea level rise, of course. Divide 700, which was here, by 10, that is a 70 fold increase of the hazard for this very particular location. And then you have this all over the city. And so you see that sea level rise by itself is one hazard, but when combined with storm surges, it really creates havoc. I try to illustrate that with another slide here. This shows from 1950 to uh, Sandy, all the storms that had considerable flood levels in and around the city. And this is the magic marker where the subway system starts to get flooded. Only Sandy in 2012 exceeded this critical lower critical elevation. All the others touched on it, but didn't quite make it. And so in a way the city was sleeping uh, because essentially its main uh, lifeline was still functioning in most of those prior cases. But if you now have sea level rise, let's see those uh, six feet uh, for the 90 percentile for the year 2100, and assume that all these storms will occur, let's say roughly 100 years later, or in the next century or so, then what will happen is, and now I'm adding the six foot sea level rise to those prior storms here, then every one of those storms will of course flood the subway system. And there are others that are not even on that graph that also will exceed this level <clears throat> because they may be down here. By the way, <clears throat> this graph shows, I should have pointed that out, in gray what the tides uh, were when the storm hit. So you can see it hit at either high or low tide. And often people said, uh, well, Sandy was at a high time. Yeah, it was high and on that day, but it was not high compared to other tidal levels, astronomical tidal levels that the city has experienced before. The dark blue is the contribution of sea level rise over time from 50 to 2012. And you see how that gradually increases with sea level over time. And uh, this uh, light blue on top of this is the actual storm driven storm surge that together with the tides and sea level is then what's called the storm tides. So, but the bottom line here is that sea level rise really will create havoc for not only uh, living spaces, but for the infrastructure. Now here's a compilation of four maps 
in the upper left, uh, there is a three foot sea level rise, a six foot sea level rise in the upper right, a 10 foot sea level rise in the lower left. And here we have on the lower right, the sandy inundation map. And what's shown here is the flooding level during the daily mean high water. That means during the average high tides, not mean tides, not low tides, during the high stand, but it's averaged between the two higher of the day and averaged over the whole year. So that's an average of an average, okay? And it's combined with the sea level rise of three feet. And that would be reached according to the NPCC uh, 90 percentile in the year 2060. The six foot would be by the end of the century and uh, the uh, 10 foot would be reached uh, if we extrapolate beyond 2100 in the year 2040 with a 90 percentile sea level rise. But it could be reached uh, with the uh, Antarctic rapid ice melt scenario. Now let's focus on the lower left, the 10 foot sea level rise. It just looks almost in detail just like the sandy flooding situation. So this would be roughly twice a day on a sunny, nice day without any storm, just from sea level rise alone. We would have a situation at those times uh, as we had during sandy minus the wave action and debris that comes with the storm. That's of course disconcerting. But let's keep that image in mind here on the lower left because we need it uh, a little bit later. Now I'm switching gear. Now, if you like, climate change adaptation can be looked at as a form of risk management. So what is risk? Well, risk is the potential for future losses. If you do it probabilistically and then annualize it, it, you could have an average loss of dollars per year. Or if you do it for a particular event, like let's say Sandy or Irene, then you have the dollar amount for that particular event per event. So the dimension, if you go to the bottom line, risk can either have dollars per year if it's annualized probabilistically or dollars per event. And it's the product of three factors. The hazard, let's say the flood height during Sandy, the assets that are exposed to that flooding times the vulnerability of those assets to that hazard or hazard level. The hazard, and I'm going to the lower left of this Venn diagram, has either an annual probability per year, something per year, or for a given event, it's the hazard of that event. The assets, which some people call exposure, has of course, if you like in our society, a dollar value. Not everything can be monetized. There are cultural and social values that you may not want to assign a dollar sign to. But for the moment, let's do and assign a dollar value. And then the vulnerability of those assets to the hazard is a dimension, but dimensionless a figure that varies between zero to one. If it's zero, then this particular asset to that hazard is totally immune. There's no loss. There's no damage and therefore no loss. If it's one, then the whole asset is totally lost. Its total value is gone. And in reality, of course, you have values in between. So now we know how to actually quantify and assess risk, not just for point by point by building by building, but you can integrate, of course, or sum up 
over the whole area, let's say New York City or whatever region of interest. Now we want to manage that risk and you can't manage what you can't measure. Now we learned how to measure it. Now let's see how we can manage it. Well, we look at where the assets here and the hazards overlap. In other words, where we built either inside this part or outside the flood zones. And that's regulated by land use and to some degree in zoning <clears throat> on a longer time scale, urban design. But you also can try to modify the hazard by building sea gates and barriers or you can retreat your assets out of the flood zone. So these are the options that interact the assets with the spatial distribution of the hazard. The interaction between the assets, the built environment and their vulnerability is regulated by engineering standards, building codes, by structural codes, professional codes, architects, and by the design details of a structure. So we have these different options by which we can manage the risk. Now, switch gear again a little bit. There are fundamentally three modes of adaptation to sea level rise and storm surge. And some we just discussed, maybe you can protect with levees, dikes, and storm surge barriers. I haven't talked and will not talk much about accommodation. That means essentially you live with the water in some areas where you have single family houses, like in some ports of uh, outer parts of the suburb uh, of New York City and Queens and, and uh, Brooklyn you may raise individual buildings on stilts, but then the streets are still flooding. Or you may have, as the uh, Danish and uh, some other Scandinavian Dutch uh, have done, you may start to build floating structures here, which is very adaptive, but that uh, has, of course, its limitation. Or strategic relocation to higher ground. But that means you have to have higher ground. And we have the luxury in New York City that we do have higher ground. We have the Brooklyn Heights, the Jackson Heights, yes, the Morningside Heights, even so we build in Manhattanville. And we have the Washington Heights and the elevations go up to 400 feet in Staten Island and to almost 300 feet uh, up in Manhattan, upper Manhattan in 200 feet or so in, in uh, Queens and, and, and Brooklyn. Uh, by the way, I for another talk, I circled here the red uh, areas, which if you, uh, you know, look carefully, they don't have any street pattern and so there's no buildings there at all. These are the graveyards. That's where the dead are living. So they live in the safest place in New York City on high ground. Uh, reasons I can't go into it, why that uh, historically developed in such a way. Um, so let's start with option one, protection. After Sandy, there was the uh, federal co uh, competition by HUD Housing Urban Development uh, that Obama uh, initiated uh, an initiative called Rebuilt by Design, RBD. Uh, and uh, one of the best known uh, proposals was the so-called Big U that wraps around Lower Manhattan here. Uh, it is a, a park system disguised as levees or levees disguised as a park system. And uh, uh, it uh, was a very good idea and I will come back to that. Uh, I want just to point out uh, that there's a very narrow strip here that we will revisit here uh, between uh, the uh, 
uh, you know, south of the Brooklyn Bridge uh, near Seaport down to where the ferries are, and we will come back to this particular area here. So this was a proposal, and uh, we will get back to that. But as sea level rises, you will have to raise those levees and dike systems. And here is a Dutch cartoon, which really applies not to New Amsterdam, but to old Amsterdam in the Netherlands, in which he depicted what this might look uh, in the future, where the rivers and the boats are up here near the skyline. And we live down here behind these seawalls, if that's what we do. And maybe the Dutch will have to do that for a while because they don't have much high terrain. Now, that's a cartoon. Let's go what people propose as alternative, which is still protection, but it's a different kind of protection. It's not the kind of localized protection that we just had here wrapping around lower Manhattan. It's a regional protection. And that's part of that HATS study, the Harbor and Tributary study, uh, where you would connect from Red Hook to Breezy Point across the outer harbor with a system of sea gates and barriers. And uh, it, of course, has openings for letting uh, ship traffic through. And uh, it's mostly open to let the tides in and out. And that would obviate, obviously, uh, to do all these local measures that have been proposed in all five boroughs. You would simply wait till, until the storm comes and then close and keep the storm out. And when the storm is gone, you open again and uh, the ocean uh, will be low enough. So there is really prevention. It's very effective if it works right. London in the upper left has built it, rather than uh, and another place uh, in the Netherlands have done that now uh, since the 1950s very effectively and it's worked well. Actually, there are three cities, uh, Providence, Rhode Island, Stanford, and one more uh, in New England that had those barriers that were built uh, after uh, three storms starting with the 1938 hurricane. And they have worked during Sandy and so very well. So what's wrong with them, if there's anything wrong with this? Well, let's think a little bit. Let's step back. Now we have sea level rise, not just storms. And when sea level rises, let's say six, eight feet, or nine for the Aram scenario, then as we have seen before, it almost looks like Sandy. So first, we would have to ever more frequently close those gates here. But eventually, we would need to close them permanently so, so the ocean doesn't flood the whole metropolitan area inside the harbor, all right? Well, it doesn't work. Why? because after all, we have a Hudson here and we have a, a, a Raritan River coming out of New Jersey and they want to get out to the ocean. So you get flooded from behind. Actually, if you would keep uh, the barriers closed, the flooding behind the barriers would be high, higher than outside in the ocean eventually. So obviously something is not quite right. And believe it or not, the US Army Corps of Engineers uh, was not to allow, was not allowed in its original study to consider sea level rise because that's of the federal script right now. That will change. Also that study has been temporarily called off uh, just two months ago. Uh, because 
the money was withdrawn from the US Army Corps of Indian budget and was put by the current administration in the Mexican border wall. So <clears throat> we see how short term and long term things are conflicting. But so it's a mixed blessing in a way that this uh, study is on hold because we have a little bit more time to do more modeling and think about the long term consequences. Now, costs. Uh, <clears throat> there was a Columbia uh, meeting, uh, I think it was late last year. And uh, the original costs for that uh, alternative two that we just discussed was about 120 to 140 billion dollars. In that uh, presentation, they had brought it down to 62 billion dollars. And by some measure, <clears throat> which I can't get into the details, they came up with a benefit to cost ratio of two to one. That means the costs uh, uh, over the uh, avoided losses uh, is a fact of two to one. Uh, there are time issues in there. I can't get into that. On the other hand, if you do peripheral uh, work all around, let's say the big U and other places in the borrowers, it would cost you probably in the order of $20 billion. So you have actually a $40 billion dollar difference, or if that number is higher, more than $40 billion to play with. And you could use that money if it were available through the budgeting process, which is probably not an easy one to do, to play with and use that $40 billion as a down payment towards buying out people in the low-lying areas of New York City and the Rockaways and so on. 40 billion is quite a bit. It's not just buying them out. You have to buy, you have to build, of course, new housing in high-lying areas, public housing, affordable housing. You have to build schools, transportation systems that accommodate those moved populations in the different parts of the city. So, $40 billion is a down payment, by no means would it cover what's needed to achieve that. But let's keep that as an option in mind. Now, <clears throat> there is a residual risk from such regional Seagate protections as we, or rather the New Orleanians have experienced after Katrina in August of 2005. If those things don't function for various reasons, in this case because they weren't really <clears throat> updated uh, because New Orleans is sinking with the Mississippi Delta into the ocean, uh, and other reasons, then you have this kind of catastrophic situation if uh, you rely on sea gates like this. If you move people to higher ground, then this residual risk does not exist. Now let me come back to a proposal that was floated late last year and early this year by the mayor in his state of the state speech. Again, we look here at the big U overall, which is now broken down into five or six individual projects. Each has its own financing, uh, uh, even different jurisdiction because Battery Park is not even part of New York City. It's really a state property. It is owned by the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. <clears throat> and so the state uh, has control over it. Uh, then this is, of course, the Battery Park. But this area is the last one that until recently didn't even have a plan. And it's exactly the <laughs> financial district with a high concentration of um, assets behind it that are important to the economy. So the mayor, with the help of the EDC, that's the um, Economic Development Corp 
Corporation uh, of New York City and uh, its consultants have proposed how to protect this area. And the way they have done it is schematically shown here in this lower panel here. Here you see the location on uh, this insert here on the right, uh, this red circle, which is replicated here. They said there is such a narrow strip that's so full of in the infrastructure in underneath, subways and other things, uh, that we can't really build a levy system there. So they came up with the following fantastic schemes. They said, let's reclaim new land, build a new island or peninsula out there, and put uh, you know, billions of new structures on top of it, and they would be privately financed, and therefore there would be a conversion for, from the private sector to uh, building this new uh, extension of Manhattan. And uh, we make it high enough so it doesn't float, uh, flood. And uh, we then can build actually defenses on that new thing in such a way that the financial district behind is uh, protected. Well, there's a problem with that because if you look at the distribution of flood zones in the city and most other places, that are densely populated. They are actually reclaimed land, former marshes that we filled in. So we are doing essentially the same thing, just slightly higher, so it would work for a while. But we just postpone the problem to higher sea levels, and then we have exactly the same mess again, just with more assets just what we don't need. If you step here across the East River on that inset and go to that red circle here, and you look from Manhattan across the East River towards the East, towards Williamsburg, then that's what you see here. All these new developments on the upper right, that's almost completed. That is almost completed here. This being, has been just proposed two months ago. That's only a plan. And so we see what have we learned from Sandy. We are still in the old mode of developing on the waterfront. And it's almost incredible that the city, the state, and nobody else is not stepping in and saying, hold on, we can't do that. That's liability for future generations. It may work very well, particularly if we build those barriers for the next 50, maybe even 100 years. But then we simply have the mess even multiplied for the future generations. Here's another example. You see here in various colors, the current flood zone, 1% current sea level, in orange plus two feet sea level, and in green, four feet of sea level. In 2016, the mayor proposed a project called BQX that stands for Brooklyn Queens Connector. And it is a very reasonable proposal from a transportation point of view. If we start on the lower left, you see this snake red line that goes to the north. While all connections between Manhattan and Brooklyn going east-west, there is no no southwest northeast connection. And so it is reasonable to propose such a connection. But when you look what was proposed in detail, 
you see that this line connects one flood zone with another. That is, of course, of great interest from a commercial point of view, because in these areas that we just have seen here in Williamsburg, there is great interest to have this north-south connection if there's commercial activity in those areas. But if you look here on the lower right, you see that this is a street level trolley. And if that's the case, then it will be very frequently flooded very soon. So it is yet another example in this case for infrastructure where we built things near the waterfront and in flood zones that are just not sustainable. I would suggest if we have to build something along this pathway as proposed for the BQX, then we could do this here, shown in the upper right. This is a elevated monorail that has been working now for 120 years. And uh, it avoids being in the flood zone, it's over the flood zone. There are of course technical issues, how to connect from above to the other subway stations that are below ground. It's probably more expensive up front, but it is a sustainable solution. And that's my whole point. Do we build things now that we will regret in a few decades and definitely in the century or not? Let me come to the third point of the basic modes of adaptation, and that is strategic reloca relocation to higher ground. We have seen this slide before, uh, and it shows the topography of uh, the five boroughs of New York City from the lower left in Staten Island. It is as much as uh, more than 400 feet, and in Brooklyn on Queens, uh, it's 200. By the way, there are these circles, which are cemeteries, uh, which are uh, not obviously occupied by living, but uh, that's where they live the dead. And uh, it is an interesting question since many of them, I think all of them are privately owned. Will there be enough development pressure for them to be bought out? And I'm not saying this facetiously. Uh, I would not be surprised if there is pressure on the owners of those cemeteries to uh, convert them to a living space. But what I really want to show you here is the following. While we do have high topography to build future habitats, public housing, new schools, new transportation system to serve those people that have to move to higher uh, elevation. Look what has happened in the last 10 years or I should say from 2000 to 2010, between the last two census tracts. You see here a map of Manhattan and all the census tracts shown in blue are those where we have put new population into each of those census tracts. And the intensity of blue shows uh, the concentration, the number of people that uh, were brought in. And in red is shown where we have thinned out the population. When you compare this area here in red in Upper Manhattan, that's where the high-lying areas are. And here are the low-lying areas. We have still the wrong policy. We put more people in harm's way in lower elevations and thin out in the safe places at high elevation, the people that have lived there before, and now we have fewer people living there. So again, it is an example where our current policy, or at least the practice thereof, 
whether that's intention or unintentional. It's intentional definitely where we bring in new people here in the blue areas, but it's probably unintentional to thin them out at the higher elevations. So that is to say, we have the option to retreat to higher ground because we have topography that other places don't have, and yet we are not using this natural resource right now. Here's another example. Uh, I have borrowed this slide from Susanna Drake. She is a, uh, the owner of a studio called D-Land Studio, a landscape architect. Um, and uh, some Lamontas may recognize that name Drake. She's actually the daughter of one of the former professors at Lamont, who then later on uh, moved to uh, New Hampshire and to Dartmouth. And here she proposed the following. The green areas are what the New York City Emergency Management Office calls evacuation zone A. And she proposes to move people out of the evacuation zone A's into non-evacuation zones shown here in green by doing the following. Give developers the possibility to build to higher elevations in those gray areas. Charge the developers a fee for this development right and then use some of those monies to buy out the people so when the housing in the high elevations is completed, they actually can move there. That takes care only of part of the problem because we need more transportation, schooling, the whole social infrastructure, not just living habitats. But it's one concept to address that, not just from the built environment, but also from the financial aspect. That was the concept, buy people out from the parks and marshes and put them into the higher area and finance by allowing development rights and monies thereof being used. Many people say it's too expensive to buy out people, but let's first look at the numbers. Uh, in dark, you have the number of people that live in the current 100 year flood zone. That's about just below half a million people. By the mid 50s, middle of the century, in the same flood zone, we may have a total of almost 800 million people living in those flood zones. Uh, the number of buildings currently in the current flood zone is about 80,000. And by the end of, uh, or in the middle of this century, uh, it will be more than 120,000 structures. On the other hand, while these are pretty tantalizing numbers, if you look in detail, what housing is involved, then you will see that there is a dominance in some of those areas here in yellow and here in also in yellow and reddish, that many of those are actually detached homes or semi-detached homes. So there can be anywhere from one family houses to connected row houses and so on. Many of them, for instance, in the walkaways are former cottages that all have their own little plot. So in those areas, at least, unlike, of course, in lower Manhattan, where you have a totally different building inventory, these would be places where it would be entirely reasonable and feasible to buy people out. Once you have provided enough incentives 
and new housing opportunities for them in the higher lying areas. So it is in those areas relatively, relatively easy. Nothing is easy when you want to move populations, but more readily possible than it would be, of course, in the dense uh, population centers like in Manhattan and some other parts of New York City or in other cities like in Hoboken and so on, Jersey City. So let me come to the conclusions. These are not only conclusions for urban planners and decision makers, that really are conclusions that uh, apply for everybody, particularly those who are currently living actually in flood zones and in harm's way. Protection by engineered solutions, whether they are the ones that we discussed earlier, like the barriers, can protect those uh, coastal habitats and can do that quite effectively for at least, let's say, half a century and maybe longer. But they, by the very nature that we have to deal with rivers coming out to the ocean, in our case here and in many other delta cities, that they are not sustainable in the face of sea level rise because if you then have to close them more often, you get flooded from behind. There are other options of uh, adapting to sea level rise. I think the one that seems to be, in my mind, the only truly long-term sustainable solution is retreat to higher ground. That is a hard pill to swallow for the current establishment, for our current building inventory, for our, our whole life the way we are used to. But I think it is a message that really has to get around and be built into our political process. So this calls for a drastic urban transformation. And it requires all the intellectual, financial, and social resources that we have to bring to bear and make those efforts commensurate with the enormous transformative task that we are facing in the decades ahead. Now, this is not just a social and financial issue. I think we have to be totally aware of that this is a matter of intergenerational equity and justice. Because if you continue building on the waterfront and not starting to set the process in motion to retreat to higher ground, we are postponing all those efforts and the costs onto future generations. And therefore, you can call this an intergenerational equity or inequity, I should say, and justice or injustice. Okay. Because we are ripping right now the benefits from our short term investments that we are still doing on the waterfront and make all the costs for dealing with those consequences onto the future generation. So this is a moral ethical issue and therefore an imperative as I see it that I don't think uh, is really in the public uh, awareness. And I think that has to change. Now, we have seen glimmers of hopes, you know, whether it's with the Paris Agreement but then we have seen, you know, retreating from this with our current administration. And so it's this battle where we not only have to go into it from a social, financial, and technical aspect, 
but it is really a moral ethical issue. Now, there was a guy around about 7,000 years or so, maybe it was 5,000. His name was Noah. And he supposedly had a good connection to some wise man. And he knew what to do with the message, namely to retreat from his low-lying area to higher ground. And he also did this in a rather holistic, ecological way. But then there are always a few folks that don't get the message and suddenly fail and cry, help, help. So the question is, do we join the boat or do we stay on the island? And in that context, timing can be really of essence. And with that, thank you all for listening to this message. Thank you very much, Klaus. That was fantastic. Um, do we have any questions from anyone? This is Wendy. Sure. Um, so, right, I'm also an East, East, uh, East River Park um, user, and I've become concerned because there's lots of uh, flood barriers being built right now around some of the NYCHA buildings that are directly adjacent to the um, FDR and the East River Park. And it's only the buildings that flooded at Sandy that are getting uh, walls and um, other kinds of hardening for the infrastructure, et cetera. When I looked at the federal register for the project, it says protecting the NYCHA buildings is a special responsibility for New York City for the monies from the big U. Um, but when I asked, why don't we help complete that series of walls and um, hardening that's already going on so it protects the building and we can have a better plan for the park, everybody shut it down. Um, because Only because of the, the different, as far as I could tell, the different buckets where the money is coming from. I, well, what's your I question? Know. I'll leave it there. Okay, well, uh, the, there's a multitude of problems on the Lower East Side. Um, uh, uh, NYCHA housing gets a large portion of its funding from HUD, Housing Urban Development. So there are strengths attached from the federal government. Then uh, there's the state and then there's the city. And those three levels of government are not always seeing eye to eye, obviously. And then there's the community. And it has had very bad experience with the city and the EDC, the Economic Development Corporation, which really uh, is more interested in the real estate sector than in the communities. Okay. So on the other hand, I think it's probably fair to say that each individual government level or administrative level tries to do the best they see in their own silo. But what's lacking is the merging from a bottom up to top down kind of process. And as I pointed out before, the bottom up is not perfect because often very localized temporary considerations dominate the process and the arguments rather than a long-term thinking. And so what I would encourage you in the community is to, when you make your proposals to the city and to other agencies, 
have you really thought through what it means in the long run? And I mean, long run is only on my scale medium. It's not just for now, where those defenses are badly needed because otherwise those nature houses suffering again the same thing with the next Sandy versus decadal thinking where some of those defenses uh, proposed and modified uh, to the zillion times uh, for the big U uh, and um, which caused a lot of disappointment in the communities on the Lower East Side uh, really have to move forward as an interim solution until we can find public and affordable housing and private housing in higher elevations, which is a decadal task. It's a, a centennial task. And uh, <clears throat> so I would hope that the communities start to think in a broader context and not just say, oh, we are losing this playground right now, which is true. But there has to be a give and take and a merging of time horizons and generational horizons. Thank you for that. Um, very, very much appreciate your insights on that. Welcome. Other questions? Because if not, oh, I have. I'm sorry. I have. I have one quick question. If if that's okay. Sure. Go ahead. Um, thanks for the presentation. It was very uh, very interesting and a lot of things that I didn't know. I was curious about your um, your Antarctica. What is it? Rapid ice melt scenario. Whatever. What was it called? Model. Um, could you talk a little bit more about where that comes from and if um, sort of uh, research on how uh, how the ice, ice sheets are going to change in the future would change your strategy or thinking on this or are you you know is there enough um, do you have enough information on on ice sheet melt to just say okay this is the scenario we're going to go for and no amount of, of um, change would Okay, I'm not uh, the scientist with a proper scientific background here. So give you, I give you my layman's uh, view on this as I hear those things developing over lunch up at Le Mans. Uh, uh, scientists have been struggling with understanding the processes both in Greenland that is more accessible, but more so in the Antarctic, in particular the Western Antarctic so far, uh, about what the ice sheets do and how they interact with the uh, warmer oceans, gradually warming oceans, as they move down <clears throat> from the high portions of Antarctica down to the ocean level. Uh, it's a research program in, pro, uh, in progress. Uh, many of the forecasts of the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, were initially quite devoid of input from uh, the Antarctic and even parts of Greenland. Uh, and so the NPCC, has a faster process because it doesn't have to listen to many governments and find a global consensus. It only had to find a consensus between people uh, in academia, in the city, and over in New Jersey, Rutgers, Princeton, uh, and a few other ones, <clears throat> and, uh, and try to incorporate the latest science into its 2019 statement. Um, this is work in progress. I mean, just, I think last week came out an article that said, oh, we always thought the East Antarctic 
is actually very stable and actually maybe even gaining thickness of the ice sheet from precipitation. Well, apparently there's a glacier that uh, they found uh, that's running pretty fast into the ocean, even in East Antarctica. So there is a chance that even that forecast that the NPCC did for its 2019 publication of forecast, that this may have to be updated, but I should point out the NPCC did not assign a probability for its RM, uh, Antarctic Rapid Ice Melt scenario, because it felt it had to point out that this is possible, but could not assign any probability to it. And if it would have assigned the probability to it, it will, would change almost on an annual basis because the science is moving so fast. Not only the science is moving fast, apparently some glaciers moving pretty fast too. So that's a long-winded answer from a non-expert who has a little bit an insight because I talk over lunch uh, and listen to seminars like this. Uh, and uh, you have to go to the website um, of this um, uh, talk and you will find other talks that address more these fundamental scientific issues. It's in flux and nobody uh, knows right now which forecast is really that will materialize in the future. End of comment. Thank you. Well, Craig, how are oh, we Craig, do we, that, that, that was excellent, thank you. Do we, do we have any further questions? If not, then I'd just like to uh, thank the speaker again. And uh, thank you everyone for joining. I hope you have uh, a wonderful rest of the day. You bet. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you, class. Goodbye all, thank you. <laughs>